And we have people just flowing on in. This is wonderful. Looks like everybody got the link. Okay. Great. And we've got Bill coming in. Hi, Francesco. Hi, Bill. Hello, Julie. Hello, Hi, Julie. Bill. How are you? Hello, everybody. Bill, we don't have your camera on. I, oh, please. I'm trying to put it on. My camera <laughs> doesn't like Google Meet. I and, know. And, and, and <laughs> I, 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 I'm going to continue to try to put it on, but something is wrong with Google Meet. And, and I'm clicking it, and it says, sorry, can't start video. Oh, hey, Bill, no. close your Google um, that Google Meet window might still be open, and it's got control of your camera. We're on okay. it, won't, it won't let Zoom have it. Oh, he'll come back in. Okay, well, while we're waiting for Bill to rejoin us, we want to thank everybody so much for um, uh, rolling with the reschedule. This is just the life and times of, here we go, 2022. Uh, different year, same same deal. So we're all, everybody is all, all on Zoom and all the things. So we really appreciate everybody's flexibility as we had to reschedule this session. But what's actually great is we got a few more attendees and this is um, definitely a much anticipated event. And we are so excited to get things kicked off. So let's see, we are going to have- This was one of our best attended events ever. I know. I mean, I know you have, you know, folks that don't end up attending, but what, the numbers are amazing. Mm -hmm. I think it's because Francesco is so handsome. Uh, okay. it's, it's, it certainly ain't because of me, Julie Bruce. <laughs> I think maybe it's because of Bill. Bill's here. Hey, there there's you Bill. Go. Greetings. Welcome Greetings, back. Bill. How are Sorry you? about that, that confusion. That was totally my bad. Well, all right, everybody, I think we are ready to get things kicked off. So I will officially say good morning or good evening, wherever you might be in the world. Um, my name is Kaylee Garrido, and I head up marketing and events here at Great Data Minds. Uh, so for those of you who don't know us, uh, Great Data Minds is a collective of passionate data activists, and we are on a mission to change the conversation around data and analytics. Um, we offer a full range of services for strategic planning, education, and the deployment of critical data projects. And we also produce a whole bunch of great uh, data-related content and events, just like today's session. Uh, so check us out at greatdataminds.com and uh, see what we're up to next. So a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, this is a webinar, so of course your cameras and your mics are all turned off, but we love to hear from you. And I see that the chat is already lively. Uh, we do encourage you to enter in your um, questions or suggestions or links or, you know, just kind of keep that conversation going there. Um, but we'll also leave a little bit of time at the end of the session for but a more formal Q&A. Um, so today we are here to listen into a great discussion between some very passionate data and analytics uh, professionals. This is the next installment in our ongoing author series. And today we are exploring the new book, The Unified Star Schema. And this is by Bill Inman and Francesco Puffini. Um, a little brief bio on each of our authors here and our speakers. Mr. We're going to start with the legend, Mr. Bill Inman. He is uh, just the he's he's the he's the one when it comes to this uh, data warehousing in the world of data and analytics. And he is known as this is quote the father of data warehousing. Um, so Bill is the most prolific and well-known author worldwide in the big data analysis, data warehousing, and business intelligence. He's a founder, a chairman, a CEO, a board member, a best-selling author, the list goes on and on. Bill, you have built up an amazing career, and we are just so happy to have you here with us today. It's my pleasure, Kelly. Awesome. Um, and then we also have, of course, the one and only Francesco Fufini. Uh, he is an Italian freelance consultant that specializes in BI and data warehousing, and he is the actual inventor of the Unified Star Schema. He is currently working as a BI specialist and innovator, and after 20 years being spent on business objects, Click, Tableau, SQL, Teradata, and data modeling. So, uh, Francesco, thank you for joining us as well. Hello, everyone. Hello. 
Um, and then the usual, the usual faces for great data minds. We have Mr. Mike Lampa. He's our very own chief analytics officer. Um, he's built up an amazing career working with enterprises to transform their analytics programs. And of course, um, also Julie Burrows, who is our CEO, and she is uh, just kind of popping in for a little bit of color and flavor as we go uh, get this kicked I off. I have one so credit, one, I mean, one question, not credit, question. <laughs> Where in the world is Francesco? <laughs> the answer is I'm always in a different place. Today, I am in a, in a house in the mountains in, uh, in Italy. So it's uh, very cold outside. And I have a big fireplace, as you can see here. And um, yeah, I mean, it's in Italy. I love it whenever you talk to him, he's somewhere different and he always shows you where he is, you know, <laughs> so. <laughs> well, we've already tested with Francesco and we're anticipating perhaps a little bit of connectivity issues. So we have instructed him to sit right where he is. <laughs> Stay in your seat, sir. Okay, so uh, Mike, I will flip it over to you. Well, thank you, Kaylee, and thank you for putting this together. You did a stellar job, as always. And good morning, Julie. How are you? Good morning, Mike Lampa. <laughs> and Bill and Francesco, how are you both doing today? I'm doing fine. I'm, uh, as everybody knows, we had to reschedule the event. I'm recovering from COVID. Uh, I'm out of the hospital, and I have I have very few. I have a few symptoms left, but Basically, I'm in good health. Oh, that's so Wonderful. heartwarming to hear. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining. So let's get after it, boys. Um, so this book that you that you both uh, co-authored, um, two parts that you kind of broke it out into two two uh, parts and two <laughs> sections. The first is around architecture, Bill, that you authored, and first I have to tell you. My dear friend, I loved the trip down memory lane as I read through the architecture part of the book. Um, and I, I will tell you, you fought a hard fight because I remember when we first started out and I got first got exposed to, to your your concepts that, that you got a ton of pushback. And would anybody have ever thought and would you have ever thought, Bill, that it is projected right now to be a $684 billion industry by 2030, growing at a, a compound a aggregated growth rate of 13% from now until 2030. Did you ever think? Mike, uh, the only reaction I have to that is an old saying that <coughs> standing armies cannot stop an idea. This time has come. And, and uh, 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 IBM, Microsoft, Oracle, all of them tried to block data warehouse and architecture. And where are they at today? So uh, no, I never ever figured it would come to this, but uh, uh, did I have confidence that uh, we were gonna win? Yes, I had confidence, but I knew it was gonna be a long battle. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, many rewarding careers were launched. Uh, as a result of uh, you fighting that good fight. Uh, I, for one, am one of those people. I have been enjoying my career since 1996 until now, doing nothing but data and analytics. And it is the most rewarding experience I've ever had. So I thank you and I'm in, in, indebted to you, sir. Thank you. So let's talk. So one of the concepts that came out loud and clear is the enterprise data warehouse still has a very important place in this architecture. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Well, uh, data warehouse is really uh, uh, an evolution of data architecture and evolutions never end. Uh, uh, you can name any evolution you want to and they may slow down. Uh, they, they may have detours that they take, but, but evolution is something that never ends. Data warehousing was really and truly uh, the first step in an, in an evolution, and it continues to evolve today. I agree with that for sure. And, and one of the things that you pointed out is, is it's an important element to help us combat data mart sprawl. Uh, yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> and, and, and you can ask my friend Francesco about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
And, uh, you know, the one thing I, I, as I was reading through your book, you know, the people kind of evolved away from the enterprise data warehouse. Um, but my spidey sense and my, my belief is it's still an important architecture and it's a right architecture, but people executed and their approach was wrong. Mike, when Data Warehouse first started, uh, year 2K was just ending and all of the big consulting companies were looking ways for ways to keep their consultants employed at all of these institutions. And that happened to be the time when Data Warehouse came about and all of these big consulting companies they, they learned the words data warehouse. They had no idea about the concepts, the structures, the, uh, the work, the, uh, the, 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 the getting your hands dirty aspect. And, and what's really stupid is, is these large consulting companies uh, came along and the public bought it. They said, oh yeah, the XYZ company understands data warehouse, let's go buy it. And, and the biggest bunch of monstrosities were ever built. And what's interesting is, is when these monstrosities failed, Data Warehouse got the blame. It's, 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 like, it's like your neighbor going and robbing the bank and then the police coming and arresting you. Well, you're not responsible for your neighbor. You didn't rob a bank. You didn't have anything to do with it, but, but you get the blame for it. And, and so uh, that, that's, that's what happened. It is, yeah. I saw a lot of examples where hey, let's go boil the ocean. Let's build the entire enterprise data warehouse, spend a couple of years. Um, and once we have the data built, they will come. Yeah. But what also happened is many, many application, or I'm sorry, organizations kind of took this application centric approach to load data marts. What was the, the what do you think that was the, the underlying reason? Why did people go down that route? Well, uh, data warehouse never was easy to do. And I never said it if I, I never said data warehouse is fast and easy. Data warehouse is, is an architecture and it's difficult to do. People were looking for a cheap, fast, easy solution. And Ralph Kimball came along uh, with the, 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 his data marts and, and he confused people. He called a data mart a data warehouse. And it says, oh, it's easy to do. We can just prop one up here and whatever. And uh, I, I never wanted to get into a fight with Ralph Kimball, but, uh, uh, and I never did, but, uh, 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 but Ralph uh, uh, set people off down the, the wrong path. And, uh, and the path he uh, sent people uh, down was one that has long-term consequences. People end up, creating these data marts and, and they don't build the foundation of data on which they can uh, build things into the future. And, and it left a lot of people. And again, with a bad taste, Ralph Kimball called a data mart, a data warehouse and data warehouse ended up getting the blame. Again, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's you have your neighbor rob a bank and the police come to put you in handcuffs. <laughs> yeah, well, and there were costs, I mean, tangible, real costs um, uh, that were incurred as a result of this application central oh, approach. Sure, and, and of course there were. There were all kinds of costs. And, and uh, yes, of course, it was a failure. And, and then my friend Francesco came along. And when Francesco came along, uh, I, I recognize that, gee, there is a better way. There is a better solution than what we're doing now. And mm -hmm. uh, it was a, it was a, a first off, I, I don't know if you know the story, but Francesco and I met over the internet. He sent me uh, an email and we started corresponding over the internet. Uh, uh, and I thought what he had to say was most interesting. And so... Uh, uh, he, he actually got on a plane and came to America and stayed at my house for about a week. We had a great time. Uh, we did more than business. We had some fun along the way. And, and you can ask Francesco about that. And, and, and uh, uh, we had some fun along the way. Uh, but uh, uh, I recognized that Francesco had uh, a superior solution than to what we were doing. And 
Uh, I don't think Francesco had ever written anything in his life as far as a book is concerned, but I greatly encouraged him to uh, put down his thoughts in a book. So there's there's a there's some pretty healthy insidious technical debt that has built up for organizations, large organizations, small organizations that took an application centric approach versus an integrated data mart approach. Is there? Can you make some recommendations out of how we can start to evolve back to this more dependent data mart approach? Let me tell you, it's like hunger. As long as there is a hunger for reliable, truthful, uh, believable information, you're gonna have a data warehouse. And it just depends on how hungry an organization is. Show me an organization that does things superficially, they're not gonna care, they're not even gonna know that they're in trouble. Uh, show me an organization that truly wants to get at the root of, of believability of data, and they're the ones that uh, Data Warehouse has a place at. Gotcha. Yep. So there is, there is, there's a way to incrementally build out the Data Warehouse. Oh, absolutely. There's always been a way to do that. Yeah. Okay. And then rehone what the source to the that's loading the data mart to feed from the data warehouse as opposed to directly from the application-centric approach. That's correct. Okay, all right. So that's one way to knock down our technical debt. Let's turn, Francesco, to you. Let's talk a little bit about this unified star schema. What is it? I don't know. <laughs> I just talked about it. <laughs> well, it's gonna be a short discussion then. <laughs> I used to call this the universal puzzle before I met Bill. And then when I flew to, to the US and we were spending a week together, as he said, uh, he came up with the name, the Unified Star Schema, and we agreed that this will be the title of the book. Um, mm -hmm. I used to call it universal puzzle before because uh, it was, the idea was that uh, in a puzzle, you have many pieces and, uh, and uh, there's basically one way to put them all together that gives you the, the final view, the final frame that uh, shows you all the content. And, and I said, with a puzzle, you have only one solution, while with the Legos, for example, you can make many different constructions. So I came up with the idea that uh, I had to put the things together in a way that is universal, that basically doesn't matter what question you have, uh, the answer will be in that uh, structure that you have put together. Mm -hmm. So what problem are you trying to solve? Well, there are several problems that I'm trying to solve. One, that my mother is setting the house in fire, and I don't know why she did it, but... Yes, that's awesome. You, you only, so you only <laughs> see stuff like that here on Great Data Minds <laughs> webinars. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Okay. So the, um, the, there are several problems. Um, wait, I, I'm moving to another room, I guess. Um, I, I am in a, in a situation where my internet connection is not good and I have a few challenges. I hope that here it's uh, I'm probably going to be better. Yep, so the that. problems that I wanted to, show, to solve are uh, several, but uh, the main problem that probably caught the attention of Bill is that uh, today in organizations, there are many, many data marks, and there are really, really too many. So what happens is that every time that someone wants to see something, there is a developer who needs to write some code, either SQL code, like writing a view on, on their Oracle or, or Teradata or Snowflake, or uh, they have to create a solution in a BI tool connecting the tables in a different way that depends on, on the business requirement. Mm. So for each question, there is some coding, some development. Mm. And that's the main problem that I wanted to solve. And uh, in this initial image that I was exchanging with Bill, I said, Bill, there are too many data marks. And he said, I agree, come to America, let's speak about <laughs> it. He didn't say it, it's Italian accent. And that's how I see it. So um, yeah. A redundancy of data marks, which reflects into a redundancy of code. Too much work, too much of transformation. So that's the main problem I wanted to solve. And then the other problems I wanted to solve are related to um, mistakes in the reports. 
very often we find in the reports numbers that do not match the data source. And usually people are saying, yeah, because the, the, there, are, there is a lot of data and because the business requirements are unclear and then there is a delay in the data transfer. But actually I, I show in the book that even when you have some very small data sets and, and very ideal conditions, you still have numbers that do not match the data source. And that was a problem that I wanted to solve. And uh, I explained that problem with the um, definition of fun traps, a definition that I gave that um, you cannot really find in literature, a definition that is very much simplified, and chasm traps and many-to-many -many relationships and loops. So these are the things that are generating problems in, in the report. And the unified uh, schema addresses all of them and uh, solves uh, all of them except uh, one particular category of loops that still requires the traditional approach, but otherwise the infrastructure schema solves a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. can, can you give us just a short description of fan trap and chasm trap? Yeah. If you Google it, you will find a lot of definitions that are really in conflict one with the other mm -hmm. because uh, there was never a, a definition that was enough general. Um, people know that there are problems when they are making some combinations of tables and they say, yeah, this is a fun trap or in, they call it fun out in, in Looker. And, but if you look at the definition, uh, if you look at the definition that are on internet or in the in the white papers of uh, Looker and business objects, they are not exactly uh, matching. So I gave a definition that is basically saying you have a fun trap when you have a table with a measure, the measure that you want to see in a report, and there's a second table that uh, duplicates that measure. So it's a simple one-to-many relationship. So when you have the numbers in a table that many to one to another is not a problem. But when you have numbers in a table that is one to many to another, then numbers are duplicated and the final reports are incorrect. Mm, okay. All right. So I'm, I'm getting a feel for how the unified star schema architecturally can start to address the, 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 the insidious problems with fan traps and chasm traps. Um, well, what's in it for the business? Why would the business say, you know, okay, I already have a, a series of data marts. Why do I need this unified star schema? You mentioned a little bit about more independence from development, but you know, what's in it for the business community? Well, imagine you're a business person and they tell you um, the solution is in Tableau. And you say, oh, great. So you go to Tableau and then you connect and there are 700 reports, 700. And this is the number of reports that were, uh, when I was working in Deutsche Bank, they had 700 reports. And you say, okay, no problem. So tell me which one of the 700, and they tell you, you find out. <laughs> Open each of them and find your answer. So this is the reason. People don't know where to go because there are too many reports, too many views, too many solutions. So if I was a business person, I would prefer to know that I can go to a place one single place where I find all that I want, self-service. So I don't need to ask for a developer to develop a solution. And then uh, whenever I have a new question, I go to the same place and I get the answer because the structure in this uh, new uh, data mart is independent from the question that uh, people will have. Okay. Um, I like that idea because here at Great Data Minds, we're very much advocates of true self-service analytics for the business that they're going to ideate at scale and innovate at scale. Um, all right, so can we talk a little bit about, tell me the architectural components and the elements of, of this unified star schema architecture. Well, first of all, you need to know that the unified star schema is not a replacement for data warehouse. It's just a proposed alternative for the presentation layer of a data warehouse. Mm -hmm. So the unified star schema is basically uh, ideal when you already have your data warehouse or data lake or data lake house you want to, whatever flavor you have, and you simply need to do the last mile, which is delivering data to business. And it is the last mile, but it's actually the most important. So it's much simpler than you can imagine because when I'm implementing this solution for clients, what I simply do, I, I go to them 
and and they think that we have to restructure everything, rebuild everything. And I say, no, whatever you have, it's good. We keep it. Just we add one new thing. There is a, a, a new schema, typically, a collection of tables where we put the, the, the central table, the Pupini bridge, and then we put all the other tables that can be phase, purchases, whatever. And then it's, the architecture is, is so simple that I even have a shame to call it architecture. It's just a, a new way of connecting tables, but it's basically tables in a database. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. So the Pupini bridge, that sounds like it's the key enabler there. Right? Um, the thing is, also I didn't want to call it this way. It was an idea of Bill Inman to call it <laughs> Pupini Bridge. And I said, okay, let's do it that way. <laughs> um, and, and you also uh, introduced the value that you can get as part of the Pupini Bridge of using unions. Can yeah. Can you expand on that a little that, bit? Yeah, that's the key concept. So, uh, okay, union um, is a command of the SQL language. So, it's available. Anyone who is using the SQL language can make a union. But union is quite uncomfortable to do because uh, the command of union requires you to manually fill all the gaps, and it's a lot of maintenance in this command. Um, but in other languages, the, the union is much easier. So you just give a command, and the, the gaps are filled automatically. So that's probably the reason why um, no one before came with a structured uh, solution based on, on the union. Definitely developers use the union. If they have a um, sales to compare to targets, for example, they make a union. So for an ad hoc solution for a particular business requirement, people use it. But I've noticed that the union is not very popular. And that's the key uh, element of the unified schema. Because when you pile up, so a union means that you put rows above each other, while the join means that you, need, you put columns next to each other. So when you pile up rows, then everything becomes easier because in any case, the tools of business intelligence, they do automatically the aggregation. So even if you want to compare a number that is a row number two and the number that is a, a, a row number 10, well, the aggregation is happening automatically. So that's probably why people were saying, no, let's not use the union because it's uncomfortable to, to, to give as a command and also because numbers don't end up to the same row. But uh, that's the key of the success of the unified schema. You do a union, the numbers are not in the same row, but they are in the same virtual row. So it's the row that is generated automatically when a business intelligence tool creates an aggregation, so reduces the number of rows because you're watching through a particular dimension and everything then goes to the same virtual row and calculations are possible and everything becomes much easier. And, and you, you did um, hit and hint upon uh, within the book um, a consistency in naming conventions and design. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. yeah. There's a proposed naming convention, of course, uh, it can be changed, but uh, what I wanted to make sure is that uh, um, the naming convention needs to be designed in a way that the business users are not getting confused. So um, imagine that you have in, in, two, um, in two tables uh, a column called zip code, okay? So if, if it's called zip code and, and it's a table client, then it's the zip code of the client. It's, if it's in table customer, uh, sorry, the table, I don't know, supplier, then it's the zip code of the supplier. But you have to imagine that for the business users, they don't want to think, okay, this uh, zip code means that because it is there. Just each column must have a self-standing meaning, meaning that you read the name of the column and you know exactly what you, will, uh, what you are watching. So that's the main advice. And uh, together with that, there's another uh, important function of the naming convention is that when you load multiple tables inside a BI tool, today you have to take care of the joints. And if you are a manager, you don't want to care about joints. You want to think business. You don't want to think IT. So with the naming convention, then the tables are connecting automatically. And managers, they will uh, go to the data with an approach that is more or less like the approach that you have when you go to the supermarket. If you need chocolate, you pick chocolate. If you need milk, you pick milk. So you need to be able to pick what you need. Not to, you don't need to have to care how this thing connects with the others. 
So a manager has to say, I want to see sales, I want to see uh, purchases, I want to see the warehouse. They just pull it in and the join is happening automatically. And this is happening thanks to the naming convention. Okay, very cool. Um, you mentioned Tableau earlier. Uh, in your book, you talked about the fact that several of the BI tool providers tried to put a fix over the top of the problem. Um, did you do some testing across the different uh, um, BI tools and um, where the unified, unified star schema was used and compared and contrast that to some of the fixes that the likes of business objects and Tableau and others did? What kind of testing? Yeah, I do? spent a lot of time. So, so you're speaking about fixes, you mean that uh, there is a number that is not correct and then uh, the tool is, uh, is adding a feature that somehow fixes the number. Is that what you mean? Yeah, as opposed to we, the f fundamental problem is we're serving up duplicate data. Right. It's not the BI tools problem. Yeah. I spent a lot of time on that. And um, I tell you that Tableau, before they introduced uh, the, um, the new approach that they introduced with the version uh, 2020.2, uh, so February 2020, um, before that version, they were having a big problem with duplicate. And they were solving with a, with a syntax called LOD, which means level of detail, where again, a business user, you cannot ask a business user to, to write a formula that fixes a duplicate because, first of all, it requires the business user to already know that it's a duplicate. And that's very strange because if a system gives you a number, you need to trust that number. You don't need to have to go to another place, verify if the number is correct, and then write in code to fix it. Mm -hmm. So that already doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. But they did an excellent job because they fixed it with, with a totally different approach that now has solved the problem of duplicates. Then another that deserves uh, our attention is Looker. Looker now is a problem uh, is a is a project from from Google and it has a big problem with the duplicates and they have solved it with a, with a technique called the fun out. Mm, so the, there is an automatic formula that uh, deduplicates the numbers, but that formula, if you put it in a Word document, it takes two pages. It's crazy. It's crazy big. Uh, and while the same formula in Tableau, for example, it would be sum of amounts. Some open bracket, bracket, amount, close bracket. That same formula in, uh, in Looker can take two pages or okay, mm -hmm. one page, let's say. <laughs> and that is because they are doing an average of the hash of the primary key. So they turn text into numbers and then it, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, okay, fine, they somehow solve the problem. But then they add side effects because the performance in Looker can become very bad because of this formula takes so much uh, resources to be executed that uh, it, it's not good. So it solves a problem, but it creates another problem. And uh, with the union, with a simple union, you simply don't have the problem. So talk to me a little bit about um, continually loading the bridge. What's the framework? Yeah. What kind of advice and framework would you use around that? Let me tell you one thing, and I want to be very honest with you. I have spent so much time with, uh, with Click. Uh, it's my favorite uh, BI tool. And uh, um, I, was I'm, I was mostly working with data warehouses built by others, and, uh, and uh, they were full of problems. Uh, and because I was working on Click, I, I solved the problems with the script of Click. So actually, I became uh, an, ex an expert of uh, solving the problem with Click. And it's always much, much easier. So, um, but with other tools, and I see that Julie in the chat is writing about top spots, uh, <laughs> you have, you don't have, uh, you're not loading the data inside the, the memory of the BI tool. So the solution needs to be implemented in the data warehouse. Mm -hmm. And when I wrote this book, I called Bill Inman and I said, okay, let's, let's write a book uh, about this. Uh, actually, he said, let's write a book. And I said, okay, I, I'm writing with Bill Inman, and I hope to, to catch the attention of many people, not because I want to sell something with them to them, because I, I'm not selling anything, I'm sharing just an idea, but because I need help from them. So the book is actually a message to the people who are going to continue the work that Bill and, and I have started, because I don't have all the solutions for, for loading. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, there are questions, but I guess that someone will, will handle the questions yeah, well, uh, later. Well, 
we'll get we've got some good ones coming in and uh, you know, we're going to wrap up our dialogue here yeah. in just a few moments and then we'll take those questions um so the the unified star scheme and the bridge in and of itself it can get pretty big because of its unified nature when we come to to implementation considerations is it just one bridge for the entire enterprise no, um, yeah, and the, I have to say uh, in the book I, I mentioned that, but I didn't do it uh, uh, enough. So that's a question that I hear uh, quite a lot. The unified star schema is uh, so the Pupini bridge is a single table logically, but physically you can store it in multiple tables. So imagine that you have uh, in your project you have uh, seventy tables. Okay, so the size of the of the bridge would be the sum of the rows of the seventy tables. Well, it would be a very large table. Instead, you can do um, save physically one uh, table per each stage. So basically, if you have a if you have a table of sales with the 10 million rows, then you will have another table called sales underscore uh, TBS, which stands uh, for Pupini Bridge Stage, and that would have exactly the same number of rows as the as the table of sales, and, and so on. So this way, basically, instead of having one large table you break everything into uh, many uh, smaller tables, as, as, uh, as big as uh, the original tables. And then with a view, you make the union of all of them together. And I may say, with the help of uh, DBT, you can do that uh, in a very easy way because DBT solves the problem of creating the union. It has a very nice macro that solves the problem. And uh, this way, physically, you have a size on disk that is much smaller than, than, than the size that you have normally with a data warehouse and all the data maps that you have uh, um, that you have to build because you build a, a data map for each uh, question. With the unified schema, you just build one data map for the presentation layer, and the size of, on this finally is much smaller than uh, it would be now. Yeah, we, we by our uh, product delivery team did take your concept after reading the book and of course uh, interacting and chatting with you and we applied it uh, to a couple of our clients uh, because we were having calculation problems and we were having performance problems so we we implemented it and and connect, connected thoughtspot to it and it resolved many of our, our issues and it, it's it's a pretty solid architecture so um, yeah. let's Kaylee, let's take a few questions before we get to uh, the call to action. What do, you th what do you think? Yeah, oh man, do we have some questions coming in? Everybody seems like they are really engaged. So we're just gonna start um, right at the top here. So the first question that we have is from Keith Evans. And he says, uh, what do you think is the biggest trend that is improving the current data warehousing landscape? I, I'm afraid you need to repeat it slower, sorry. Okay, uh, from Keith. He says, what do you think is the biggest trend that is improving the current data warehousing landscape? This is Bill. Let, um, me, uh, let me try to answer that one. Uh, uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, data warehousing, as far as I'm concerned, is an evolution. And it, 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 it's not going to end. It's not going to end in our professional lifetime. Uh, the latest thing that's happened is the addition of something called the data lake house. Now with the data lake house, uh, there is an addition of a new kind of data uh, and that is machine generated data. Machine generated data is very different from classical transaction, uh, uh, transaction data. And the ability to uh, take these types of data and do something meaningful with them is probably the, the latest advance. But, but is data lake house the end? No. Is data warehouse the end? No. Uh, this is an evolution that we are witnessing in our lifetime and it's going to continue to go. I, if I may pile on top of that, the enabling technologies of today for versus 2000 are helping us as well. That Absolutely, trend. no question about it. All right, Kaylee, we got another one? Let's go, let's go, we've got some, they're coming. Got some. All right, so the next question that we have is from Mary. Mary is asking, is the unified star a bridge between existing data marts and can it work virtually? Okay, so first of all, hello, Mary. 
it's good to see that you're here with us. Um, well, uh, you can do uh, quite a lot of things. So is the, is the question about virtualization? Is, did I understand correctly? Sorry, I need to have yeah, feedback from, from Mary. My sense is that there's two parts. She She's wondering, could it be a bridge between existing data marts, right? Um, and then if the answer is yes, is it, it is it a is it a bridge that we could implement as a virtual view versus a physical view is my sense is the nature of the question. Okay, sure. Yeah, it's actually two two separate um, questions, I think. So what you cannot do, I have to say, if you have uh, already your data marks that are structured in a in a thanks, okay, the feedback Mary says is correct. So if you have a structure uh, where you have data marks today, it's not like you have them and then you put a Putini bridge and then they are all sued together. That, uh, that wouldn't work because um, there is a naming convention to follow and then there is uh, especially the concept of union needs to be implemented uh, upfront. So uh, it's rather, um, uh, you can rather build a repla replacement of those existing data marks uh, inside the Putini bridge uh, and gradually migrate them to a newer uh, data architecture. When it comes to virtualization, 100% yes. So my vision is that today we cannot uh, put everything in, in one data warehouse anymore because some sources are moving so quickly that they, they move continuously and you can't make copies of them uh, to a data warehouse. So virtualization is inevitable in my opinion. Yeah, and you had uh, um, somebody that's been following you, Fabrice, um, offered up that it's almost like a supernova on top of a data ball. A supernova? Uh-huh. You got a you got a fan. <laughs> wow. Right. Let's see what else. Um, yep. We have another one coming in from Ivan. Ivan is asking, what are the main obstacles for businesses to adopt the unified star schema? To know about it. If they don't know about it, they will not adopt it. But in the moment when they know about it, uh, it has such a smooth transaction that, um, and especially it has no uh, no downside. So it, sometimes I'm making the graphics of a um, unified star schema and then, um, sorry, I'm reading what Kent is writing. <laughs> That's funny. And I'm making the comparison between uh, unified star schema and, uh, and um, dimensional modeling. And, uh, I'm saying that basically whatever you do today with the Kimball approach of dimensional modeling, you also do with the unified star schema. So there is zero loss compared to that. So I'm, uh, I'm adding something, but there is no, uh, no obstacle because basically you, you, don't, uh, you don't have a downside to it. Maybe it doesn't solve all the problems. There is a one category of problem that it doesn't solve, which is the, uh, some categories of loops. But otherwise, there's really no reason for not trying it because it's very easy to implement and you have no downside in the implementation. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, okay. Kelly, if I... Oh, go sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. Um, they're just gonna keep coming. It seems like yep. everybody is super engaged. So if you mm -hmm. have anything, you know, you just um, let me know, but I'll just keep rolling with them. So we have Shane chiming in to ask, is there any reason that we couldn't use the unified pattern for data vault, uh, such as populate the Puhini bridge with hub and link keys. So when it comes to data vault, um, I was speaking a, a few times to the conference of, of data vault and, and ex I was uh, exposing in uh, the unified source schema in general terms. When it comes to actually uh, implementations in, into the data vault, there are a few things to, to keep into account because data vault uh, gives to the user too much uh, too much power. Um, so wait, I'm trying to understand. So what is the actual question about data vault? Because I didn't hear it. My, my sense is if if I adopt a data vault as my my modeling architecture, can I use the bridge to link those hubs and what do they call them? Hubs and links or um, in essence, like yeah. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, so one message very important I have to give, and I, I, I gave this message every time I was speaking also at the conference of Dundee, that the unified schema is only in the presentation layer. 
So it has never been and it will never ever be a replacement for, for the data vault because data vault has been built by the biggest data experts I've ever met in my life together with Bill Inman. So Dan Instead was working in giant uh, projects where he had the concept of cloud even before people knew what a cloud is. Mm -hmm. And that's unreplaceable, I tell you. So Unified Schema can be only downstream of a data vault. So whenever you have built your core data vault and then it works uh, and it's built all the, the good way it has to be built, then when it comes to the uh, presentation layer, which they call the information mark, uh, when you build the information mark today in data vault, it is inspired to Kimball. So as an alternative to that, you can build the information mark in data vault inspired to the Unified Schema. But uh, it cannot uh, have a bridge between links and satellite in the core uh, part of the architecture, but only in the presentation layer, it can do some some uh, big improvement. Yes. Awesome. Very good. Looks like okay. we have got one around. Got a question around lake houses too. Oh, yep. That's a. And that's that's a lot. Lot. Um, okay. Before we get to the lake houses, uh, let's ask. Um, Arthur has asked, "What is your opinion on a metrics layer, headless BI?" And how does the unified star schema correlate to that? Wow, that's good. Actually, the unified star schema is natively a metric layer. So uh, the, when you have um, the Pupini bridge, um, I figured out, uh, especially after working a bit on, on Looker, that the best way to do a unified star schema is to put all the metrics, all the measures in uh, one table, which is the Pupini bridge. So the Pupini Bridge is the place where every number that you need, you find it there. Great. Okay, next question coming in, rapid fire. We have Brett and he is asking, Francesco, can you talk about how this is extrapolated in the lake house concept? Um, okay, whenever it comes to lake house, I, I usually would like also to involve Bill because as you probably know, Bill Inman is now collaborating uh, with Databricks and other vendors of Lake House, and he's the real expert. So maybe we can ask uh, his opinion. Uh, and it's basically, when it comes to semantics, that's one topic. When it comes to physical implementations, he's the expert in, in Lake House now. And sure, I'll, I'll try to give my take on it. When you take a look at the data Lake House, what you find is, a mixture of different kinds of data. One of the nice things about a data warehouse was it was essentially transaction-based data. But when you go to a data lake house, you find this, 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 <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> uh, this interesting collection of different kinds of data. So when I look at it, I look at the, uh, uh, the work that uh, Francesco has done uh, uh, again, is in the presentation layer. Uh, the work that's got to be done to merge together the different physical kinds of data that exist in the data lake house are, the only word I can think comes to mind is Byzantine, is, 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 is really, really kind of strange. Let, let me give you a very quick uh, rendition of that. When you're dealing with transaction-based data, you're dealing with lots and lots of transactions, each of which have their own importance. When you're dealing with machine-based data, you're dealing with something very, very different. I liken machine-based data uh, to a, uh, a, a camera put outside uh, a, a, of a parking facility for observation. So people can, uh, uh, can uh, uh, determine if, if their car is being broken into. Now, if you ever looked at a surveillance camera data, you find that 99% of the data on the surveillance is meaningless, nobody's there. What's interesting is 1% of the time when somebody's breaking into a car, your data becomes very, very interesting. And so the nature of the data that you find in the data lake house is a, is a challenge unto itself uh, uh, as to uh, uh, how to mix and match and, and match and merge the data together. So I look at the uh, 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 unified star schema that uh, Francesco has done, again, at the presentation layer. 
And before we can ever get to the presentation layer, uh, the data that's in the data lake house has got to go through this enormous transformation. I, I, I hope that clarifies the answer. Right. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Bill. Oh, <laughs> do you have something to add, Francesca? No, he was just thinking, Bill. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so the next question we have is coming in from Thirumalai. I hope that I said that right. Likely didn't, but I gave it a shot. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is, how databases like Big, Google BigQuery or Columnar databases are compatible with the Unified Star Schema? I would say natively. So the concept of the Unified Star Schema was born on, on click view, basically. And click view is by nature columnar. Um, so um, columnar is something that has to do with the physical storage. Basically, it's an optimization of the storage uh, by columns. So you store distinct values, and then you, you basically use numbers that point to the distinct values, and you spare space. So that's really a detail of physical implementation. But uh, how do you use a columnar database? Well, you query it with the same SQL that you use for, for a normal uh, database like the data data, which is rather organized by row. But uh, the SQL is the same. So it's 100% um, compatible because it's basically not, uh, not relevant too much. It can be relevant for performance, but uh, performance is a big topic that uh, you may have noticed in the book I was uh, uh, whoever has read it, I was giving very small examples with very few rows because I cared about semantics. And again, that's one of the things where I, I have to learn a lot. So I will work in the next coming uh, months or, or years uh, on, on understanding how to optimize the performance. That's where I have to learn. But I'm not scared about columnar databases because it was born on a columnar structure like ClickView. I'll, I'll just pile on that. We, the, the work we did with the Unified Star Schema was against our customers' data and BigQuery, and we got phenomenal results. Yep. Great. Okay, uh, next question is from Alessia. Alessia has asked, how can the Puffini Bridge be implemented with a data vault? Alessia, you know it. Hi, Alessia, nice to hear you. Um, Alice is my friend, and she's implementing a, a data vault um, in the UK. And um, she will, well, you will know it because I will, I will come <laughs> to help Neil Strange, and we will implement it together. Um, but um, basically, the data vault is building uh, these tables called uh, PIT and bridge tables, which uh, facilitate the, the, um, the usage of, uh, of the, the dimensional modeling uh, because the data vault is storing the history. So these are all things that can be easily solved uh, with the Unified Star Schema by applying the same choices that you would apply today uh, in any case because you need to resolve your, your history into something. Uh, it's all about a point in time. Either you use the point in time as of now or you use the point in time as of uh, date of the event, like the, the one that you have in, in the fact table, or as of uh, prompt uh, uh, to the user. These are the typical three solutions that you adopt today and you would do exactly the same with the Unified Star Schema. Great. Kelly, I think we got a little bit of time left. Maybe one more question. Yeah, let's do one more. So the last question uh, that we have coming in is from Jeff. And he says, is there a Slack channel or another forum where the USS practitioners are sharing experiences? Again, sorry, uh, I need to ask you to repeat. You don't imagine how cold I am. I'm, I'm trembling yeah, because in the, yeah. I'm in a room super cold and I'm really not in the situation. Can you repeat the question? Yes, sir. And I'm also going to put it into the chat here. So while she's doing that, yeah, while she's doing that, um, Francesco, I think uh, the question is, are there any community forums that have started focusing on uh, findings and ideas, et cetera, around the Unified Star Schema? Yeah, the, the main one that I would like to mention now is the one of DBT. So DBT is a, is a solution that uh, uh, allows uh, implementing scripting uh, that uh, integrates SQL in a, in a way that is much easier, much uh, more repeatable. And it's a community that is growing more and more. And in the Slack of DBT, there is a channel dedicated to the Unified Schema. And so um, I enter now 150 people registered there. And I see there are discussions on how to optimize DBT, absolutely. 
um, how to optimize um, the, the scripts and everything. So you, you will find it in the Slack of DBT. That's the only community that uh, I'm aware of. Otherwise, uh, yeah, some we will have to create them. Sounds like a <laughs> call to action, Kalia. Where we are creating oh, them. I just dropped into the chat here. We have our new Great Data Minds LinkedIn group where we are encouraging a lot of conversation to happen there. So everybody can just go ahead and click on that link and then um, we will get you accepted into that group. We can definitely have some conversation in there. And then the last, you know, bit to this uh, great conversation is that we do have a workshop coming up. Um, we are excited to, again, partner with Francesco um, for the Unified Star Schema Workshop for practitioners. So this is where a lot of these really technical and practical questions are going to get answered. This is happening on April 7th. Um, this is a three-part half-day workshop. Francesco is going to be running it. He's going to guide us through the current state of self-service analytics world. We're going to talk about data problems and solutions, and we're going to talk about how some of today's tech fits in. Um, and then we're going to get more into the unified star schema, this, of course, special data model that acts as a foundation for all of the possible analytical requirements for any organization. It is a lofty uh, statement, but something tells me Francesco is going to be able to back it up just fine. Um, so let me drop that uh, link for our workshop into the chat once again. And um, I think that is it. I want to thank everybody for being so engaged. This was a fantastic uh, conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. And and everybody that's on the call, I, I just um, messaged this, but thank you so much for that level of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, if there are any questions that we missed, I, I did capture the chat log, I'll go through that. And if we didn't answer a question, I'll make sure that we get back to you. Yeah, and this will be recorded and we will post this out on our social channels. I'll probably send everybody a follow up as well with this, um, with the link and, you know, with the open invitation that if there's anything uh, further conversations or if you want to get in touch with Francesco or if you want to chat with Bill or Mike or any of us, um, we will leave that open for you to reach directly out to us at info at greatdataminds.com. And um, we're look, looking forward to more. Clearly the conversation is not done around this. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen, what an honor it has been to spend this last hour with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. Thanks Thank everybody. you, Bill. Thank you, Bill, for what you did. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Kalia. Yeah, Thank thanks, you, Bill. So glad you're healthy again. That's yeah, what I love. That's the most important part. You got part. that right. You got That's that it. right. Love it. All right, everybody, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.